<clears throat> Several years back, I spent a week over the holidays with my mom and my brother and my sister back in Ontario. And as we gathered together for Christmas after I flew all night, I sat in amazement, not just at the little ones taking pleasure in opening up all of the new little dolls and all of my, my grand nieces are all girls. So it was all dolls, 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 which was fine. But I watched my mom as the matriarch of the family taking pleasure in having us all together for the first time in so many years. If you're a parent, you understand just how having children and watching them develop, how that brings great happiness to your soul. What is it that God takes pleasure in? Last weekend, I gave an overview of the purposes, and I believe that Scripture says to you and I that we were what we were created for, and I stated that everything God created was created to bring Him pleasure. In Romans chapter 4, it's, or Revelation chapter 4, it's not in your notes, verse 11, John wrote these things, you, God, created everything, and it's for your pleasure that they exist and were created. My first purpose is to worship God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Because of God's great mercy for us, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that we should offer. Has nothing to do with music. You and I as believers in Jesus are designed to worship God. In fact, can I say that every human being is created to worship? Just that for some of us, we worship our job, or we worship a person, or we worship a bottle, or we worship a sporting event. Don't bother going for the boilers. It's just not working this year. I jumped off that wagon about a week and a half ago. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't be haters. I deal with reality. A leader's job is to define reality. I just look at the... Never mind. we we'll go down that road. What you know and I know, and that they don't know, is that... They're filling a God-given space in their spirit with a very poor substitute. They do not understand why they're drawn to that. Friends, it's part of our DNA. God fashioned us to draw, be drawn to him, to exalt him, to magnify him, to use our abilities for him, to express our affection to him. Part of our worship of him is our coming together as people. And next week, I want to discuss with you why it's important to adopt God's people, enabling us to deal with the problems that life brings our way. But that's next week. The church family helps us focus on God. Why? Because there's a, a semblance of accountability to be in the house of the Lord. Now, you may come when you don't feel like it, and life tends to get you focusing on other issues, issues like the pressures of life and wealth and health and goals and dreams and hurts and self-centeredness. We are all invited to join the rest of the creation to express love and adoration to God. Now let's think for a moment. Fast forward, 13 weeks is Palm Sunday about. Hopefully the weather's warmer. Jesus is riding in Jerusalem on a donkey. And people are lining the sides of the street, praising him. You know the story. And the Pharisees spoke out to Jesus and said, rebuke your disciples, because they're, they're making such a big to-do about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Listen to what the Bible says that Jesus said. It's in your notes, very top. Luke chapter 19, verse 40. Jesus said, I tell you, if they, the disciples, keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Why do we need a corporate setting to worship in, friends? Why are we encouraging you to be here and to participate together with the other parts of God's people? Or the, not the other parts, but the other part of God's people. It's because we, we can step out of ourselves and we can focus on being part of a new humanity that God created us to be unified and holy and ready to extend the kingdom of God into the world and into our own hearts. Here's the main theme for this morning. Don't want you to miss this. We need a power to live on. That's what worship is. Everyone knows what one of these is, right? Power cord. Is this thing any good if it's not plugged in? 
What's the answer? Not a chance. So worship allows us to plug in so that we're able to get charged. We gather together each Sunday to allow the Spirit of God to descend upon His people to empower us so that we can go out into the world and be salt and light so that we can make things better and make things brighter. How many of you would say that sometimes from Monday to Friday you get the life just sucked right out of you? How many of you are sitting next? Oh, never mind, we'll just keep going here. Listen, friend, I need to get connected to the power source, and that's God. You need to be in God's house with God's people to engage in corporate praising of God. When we bless him, he blesses us. But Bob, I don't get much out of worship. That's a common line that I've heard probably every year I've been in ministry, and I've been in ministry almost 40 years. But here's the problem. Worship's not for you. Will you write this down? It's not in your notes. I didn't put it in there. But I want you to see this, understand this, and, and dwell on it. Worship is for an audience of one. Worship is for an audience of one. Worship changed for me when I visualized God at the center of the platform on a throne, receiving our praise, actively exalting him through my voice and my heart and my giving, rather than just sitting as a spectator and waiting for something to happen to me. How can I do that? Well, glad you asked. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready, we're going to learn how to tap into his power. Just turn, do that to your neighbor. Say to him. We're going to learn how to do it. All right, now room, <laughs> look back at him and said, you could use a charge. <laughs> how are we going to do it? Number one, plug into him. We need to be connected. Definition means to bind or fasten together, to unite. Choose to connect with him here with others. You see, if you and I are going to tap into this power, that dynamite power of the Spirit available for us, we have to choose to plug into the source. When I was walking through the darkest valley of my life, every, everything that I focused on with all that was going on was I chose every week to go to church regardless. There were no excuses. In fact, I would so understood, understood that I needed corporate worship that I would wake up early on Sunday morning at 7.30, grab a coffee, toast, go to bed, watch an online church service in Florida like I did this morning. Checked in with my family at Christ Fellowship Church in West Palm Beach, partly because I wanted to see what the temperature was. <laughs> they weren't wearing sweaters in church, just so you know. And after that, I'd go and get ready, and I would go to my physical church, my church home to be with other people. Friends, that was my commitment to getting plugged in with God and his people. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song recorded in the book of Exodus after watching God miraculously delivering them. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 15. I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. You and I may not be walking across a dry riverbed, but we have certainly experienced deliverance from the claws of the enemy of the soul through the power of the cross. Choose to be connected with him here with others. Look in your notes. Choose to be connected with him to overcome obstacles. When God is on my side, we are a majority. Listen to what David said in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you would say that there's been times when you have come to a worship service overwhelmed by an obstacle or a burden and that you've either been lifted because you've been in worship or you've been filled with courage to face it head on? We're going to talk about that week, next week. Number one, we've got to plug into him. We've got to get connected. The second thing is we need to observe him. We need to be close. I remember on my first or second Sunday at Sturgeon Alliance Church, one of the associate pastor's sons, he was this tall. His name was Blaze. 
And he walked up to me. I was in the foyer. He walked up to me, and he looked me up, and he looked me down, and he looked me up, and he looked me down, and then he crossed his arms like, should I trust you or not? <laughs> it was so cute. Have you ever had a little child come and check you out? David understood, by the way, he's one of the greatest worshipers of the Lord. If you want to understand how to worship God, go into the Psalms. Read the Psalms. That's the worship. That's the hymnal of the Jewish people. Look what it says in Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Do you have that same kind of curiosity about God? Do you have that same desire to search for Him? One of the most common and most disturbing facts is that most people today, most Christians do not know when they've experienced God's presence. Listen to the research that was done by George Barna. It was years ago, but it's still the same today. It's been updated. It's in your notes. One third of the adults who regularly attend church services say that they have never experienced God's presence at any time during their life. People come to church wanting to personally experience God's presence and to leave with a better understanding of how to live the Christian life. That's powerful. My prayer every Sunday is that you will experience the presence of God and leave a different person as a result of being in his presence. In order for you to experience his presence, you have to slow yourself down from your doing and allow God to speak into your being, into your core, into your center. And it's not a new problem. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is visiting two sisters that he really enjoys being with, Mary and Martha. And Martha is a doer, and she's making all the arrangements, and providing for a meal, and setting the table, and stirring the pot of stew, and, stew, and topping up the oil lamps, and making the unleavened bread. And, the old, and good old Mary is just sitting in the living room with Jesus laughing and being with him. And those of us who are Marthas read this story, and we cheer Martha on, like, you go get it, girl. You go give her all you've got. She goes into the living room and she scolds Jesus for not making Mary help her. Listen to the response of Jesus. Listen to the principle of worship here. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Martha, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Corporate worship helps us be a Mary. We need to sit to enjoy and to experience the awe and the wonder of who God is. If you are like me, sitting still, focusing on only Him every day in my quiet time, it was the hardest discipline that I ever had to do. And every day I seek to take a few moments to just sit still and to listen and to reflect and feed at the feet of Jesus. And when I do it, it's the most meaningful part of my day. And if that has not been your experience, I'm going to give you something that you can put on your phone, an app that will help you walk through and get into the consistent discipline of hearing from God. I'll share that with you at the end. Being together each Sunday helps us to, to slow down and to be still. Thirdly, we need to wait before him. We need to be confident. The family was sitting on a in a rural church while on vacation one summer, and the six-year-old, full of life and curiosity, wanted to know the significance of the beautiful stained glass windows that had been placed throughout the church as memorials. The dad said, those are memorials to all the people who died in the service. The boy responded, in innocence, which service, the first one or the second one? The point about waiting falls on the heels of what we've just discussed. I'm going to tell you something that you may not want to hear. As I've read the scriptures, I've discovered there's a biblical theme called waiting. How many of you like waiting? None of us do. I recall one summer afternoon, 
a men's night, it was a Tuesday night, I was at the golf course, we just got to our hole, and we were waiting for the horn to sound that we could start, and what happened was the sky opened up and it just started to rain, and it didn't just rain, it poured. So we were the farthest point, it's always the way it is, we were the farthest point away from the clubhouse, so we darted back a couple of holes and we found this little shack to huddle in and we waited for what we felt like was elders. I mean, we, we waited all day to go golfing and now we're waiting again. It was probably only about 45 minutes, but it was tough. But here's what I knew. If I wanted to be protected, I had to wait. It reminded me of coming together in a church like this. The passage that David spoke about, Psalm 27, <coughs> verses 5 and 6 in your notes, in times of trouble, he will shelter me. He will keep me safe in his temple and make me secure on a high rock. With shouts of joy, I will offer sacrifices in his temple. I will sing and I will praise the Lord. When you and I gather together, friends, not only do we experience the protection of the Lord, but we're able to help others find the same protection in his presence. What's interesting is protection comes from waiting. Not only does protection come from waiting, it also has an added benefit. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Some of you know this passage. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. There are times in my life when I look back and I was miles ahead of God. He had stopped, but I hadn't even noticed that he had stopped. And I had barreled on ahead in my own strength. When we seek first the kingdom of God, when we wait on the Lord, we wait and listen for his voice, we become aware of his loving presence, which is where we rest and are renewed. Amen? You are doing great today. One more. Oh, a couple more. Let's review. To embrace God's pleasure, I must plug into him, be connected. I must observe him, be close. I must wait before him, be confident. Fourthly, I must experience him. I need to be changed. Do you want to be changed by God? Yeah. It's been my experience that we won't change unless we hurt enough that we have to. And in fact, every leader thinks that everybody else doesn't like change. And I've met a lot of leaders, unless it's their idea, they don't like to change either. <clears throat> How much of God do you want this morning? How open are you to allow God to reach inside your life and change you from the inside out? Listen to this little thing that I found years ago. $3 worth of God is what it's called. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a foreigner or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the, worth, the warmth of a womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Sad thing is, many people are like that. How do I know if I've experienced God when I come together with God's people? Don't miss this. Don't miss this. It's not when I have a good feeling, but when I have a changed life. A transformed attitude. A deeper love for God's people. A commitment to honor God with my tithe or my talent. One question I want to ask you at the end of every service that you come to. The question I want you to ask yourself is, what have I changed? Or how have I changed? Not, what did I get out of it? Or what did I learn? You see, that's not enough. What will I do with what I've learned? You see, when you truly encounter God's presence, you are not the same. The psalmist David knew this in Psalm 27. We're spending a lot of time in Psalm 27 today. It was one of my favorite psalms. When you said, come worship me, I answered, I will come, Lord. Don't hide yourself from me. Teach me, Lord, what you want me to do. 
and lead me on a safe path because I have many enemies. In your notes, Ruth Center said this, worship is not a place or the forum. It's what happens inside us as we focus away from ourselves and onto God. It is coming to God for the drink. There was an old chorus that we used to sing that said, let's forget about ourselves and magnify the Lord and worship him. Friends, worship is not about you. It's about him. That's our focus in living. That's why I said to you, worship is for an audience of one. It's not about you. It's about how are we expressing that we love and we adore and we exalt and we honor him. You see, when we don't believe then we become disheartened and discouraged and then we'll settle for less and wonder why we're depressed and defeated and drifting away. Now, I read this and this just, this was just so funny. So if you don't laugh, that's okay. 12 reasons why Christians don't attend sporting events. Number one, the coach never came to visit me. Number two, every time I went, they asked for money. Number three, the people sitting in my row weren't very friendly. Number four, the seats were very hard. Number five, the referees made a decision that I didn't agree with. Number six, I was sitting with hypocrites. They only came to see what others were wearing. Number seven, some games went into overtime and I was late getting home. (coughs) Number eight, The band played some songs that I never heard of before. I hope you're getting the connection here. I can tell by your laughter. The games are scheduled on only my only day to sleep in and run errands. Number 10, my parents took me to to too many games when I was growing up. Number 11, since I read a book on sports, I feel I know more than the coaches do anyway. And here's the last one. I love this one. Number 12, I don't want to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves which sport they like best. Look what Barna says in your notes. Eventually people cease to expect a real encounter with God and simply settle for a pleasant experience. Friends, I don't want a pleasant experience. I want an encounter with a powerful living God. I want a powerful experience. I want to get connected with my God and have him exchange my pitiful efforts to worship him with an extravagant awareness of his profound love and grace. That's what changes my life. There's a principle in scripture that says, if worship is the center of people's lives, their corporate gathering will experience it. You see, in the life of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel watched the glory of the Lord leave the temple because Jehovah was not the focal point of their lives. The nation had began then to grasp for breath because God had left. They'd long since substituted worshiping of themselves for worship of their creator, but Israel fell flat on their faces but came back on their knees. They repented and grace moved in and worship was reinstated. And when worship is returned, strength and vitality returned. Here is the lesson. Don't miss this. As Israel's worship went, so went the nation. As our worship goes, so goes our church. As my worship goes, so goes my spiritual vitality. If I don't come to the well... I will soon feel the effects of dehydration. And in a corporate worship setting, I can come to the water, the rushing river of life, and be changed as I experience him in his fullness. I want to stay in the river of his love and grace. Changes our focus about coming to church. You okay? One more? Got time for one more? We got time? Yeah, we got time for one. Then I need to rest in him and be comforted. To rest in him and be comforted. One of the many privileges of, that we get to go is we get to go and be at the pastor's retreat, Cheryl, and this year we went with Liam and Rihanna. And it was, we get to sit in those sessions and just rest 
to relax and to exalt and to soak, to trust in who God is. When we come into the presence of the Lord in worship, we're able to remove ourselves from the multitude of responsibilities out there. To gather together with God's people, to be encouraged when I need encouragement, to comfort others when they need comfort, but most of all, to meet with God, with God's people. Do you come each week expecting to meet with God? Let let me just ask you a very personal question. When you're driving here, don't answer it, I don't want to know. When you're driving to church this morning, did you come with an expectancy that you were going to meet with God? Or did you just hope and pray Bob was going to be good? (laughs) Or did you think, I'm so excited, I get to sit in God's presence and have him touch me. I get to hear his word. Or I get to experience his love and worship. Friend, you get what you expect. If you expect nothing from God, chances are that's what you're going to leave with. Nothing. If you prepare your heart to come and expect him to speak to you, to sing over you, to comfort you, to sustain you, I know with certainty that he's going to meet with you. Listen to David. I love how he came with expectancy in Psalm 27. I know that I will live to see the Lord's goodness in this present life. Trust in the Lord. Have faith. Do not despair. Trust in the Lord. I can remember having my son or my grandsons when they were small, sleeping in my arms. They were so peaceful, and that was so good because my son was colicky, and when he was quiet, that was the sweetest part of the day. But why could they sleep in my arms? Because their life was centered around what I as their father or grandfather could do. So let me ask you this question, how big is your God? How big is your God today? Look at your notes. Our pivots perfect. Pippert said this, the problem with day-to-day living is that we get so obsessed with our own petty concerns that we forget the grandeur of our God. And that is why worship is so crucial. It brings us back to what matters the most. Worship not only gives us a welcome relief from ourselves, it enables us to sense the mystery and the glory of God so that we often forget this in the busyness of our own day. To embrace God's pleasure, let's review. I gotta plug into Him, I gotta get connected. I need to observe Him, I need to be close to Him. I need to wait for Him and be confident that He's gonna meet with me. I need to experience Him and be changed. And I need to rest in Him and be comforted. Today, God offers to meet me face-to-face, a private audience with the creator of the universe, anytime, anywhere, and there's no exception but love. That's grace. It is grace, especially in light of all of my rushing and forgetting and blowing it big time. But he bids me to come. If you don't, I'm going to send, I'll send this out today or this week in my Tuesday email. If I, forget, if I don't forget before I leave, I'll send you a link to this particular app. If you want to start just spending time being still before God, I want you to write this down. It's called Lecto, L-E-C-T-I-O, 365. Lecto, L-E-C-T-I-O, 365. It's a free app. And it's, <clears throat> lecto basically means a divine reading. It's, it's, it's an ancient way of hearing from God. And, and, the, and the prayer that I prayed at the beginning of my message was the prayer that we would do today for the Sabbath. It takes you about six to eight minutes. It will, this is what I love. It reads it to me. And I just sit. It has a morning and an evening reading that are very short. 
but it's purposeful. It's about being still and hearing God's voice. I'm going to challenge you, if you are not spending time with God each day, then your life's not a life of worship. It's a life that just, you're operating. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to speak into your life. And if what I spoke about today and what the Word of God instructed us with today, if that is something that just your, your soul says, I know I need this, then take the step. That's the only step. Spend time with Him. Will you pray with me? Father, we are humbled to think that you want us. No, you bid us. No, you live for us to worship you. And even though the whole creation proclaims your glory, you created us to have a power to live on. And, and friends, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I, I want to just invite you in your own spirit to follow along and pray this prayer with me. Help me to be plugged into you to make a choice to connect with you. Help me to get close enough to you to observe you, to become acquainted with your heart, to know your will. Help me to choose to sit before you like Mary and be confident in what you will do for me as I sit at your feet to worship you. Help me to expect that each time I meet with these people, my family, that I would experience you and be changed. Help me to come to you and find comfort in you since I live in a world that presses me and pushes me to be self-centered. I want to put you first to be God-centered so that I can have a power to live on. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's